Delighted to have Jerry Kaplan uh, with us tonight. His, his book, Humans Need Not Apply, Candid Call to Arms, is a, is a phrase that, that Jerry's used for, uh, for bold ideas to ease the transition through the next industrial revolution. Jerry uh, is uh, widely known as, a, as an entrepreneur, an innovator, uh, an author, uh, and a futurist. He, he founded a, a number of um, uh, Silicon Valley startups. Uh, so this is his second, if not his third career. Jerry Kaplan. What we're doing in artificial intelligence is we're building increasingly intelligent uh, machines. And it, these are becoming more and more intelligent. And some, uh, sometime soon, they might surpass human capabilities. And when they do that, they're going to start to steal our jobs and uh, possibly even escape human control. Uh, and then they're going to take over the world. Now, I'm going to present the case today that that narrative is uh, basically very misguided and, in fact, counterproductive for solving the kinds of social problems that the field is actually going to create. Consider how machines and people learn. Now, you can teach a computer to recognize a cat by showing it a million images. Or you can simply point one out to a three-year-old. That's a cat. And it gets the same job done. Obviously, humans and machines do not learn in the sense of these programs the same way. So what is artificial intelligence really? Can't they solve all kinds of complex reasoning and perception problems? Well, the answer is sure. They can perform tasks that humans solve using intelligence. But that doesn't mean that the machines themselves are intelligent. It merely means that many tasks that we thought required general intelligence are, in fact, subject to solution by other more mechanical means. These autonomous vehicles, they drive cars. They don't do other things. Robots really don't have any independent goals and desires. A robot that's designed to wash and fold laundry, it might be plenty sophisticated, but it's not going to wake up one day and say, oh my god, what a fool I've been. I really want to play the great concert halls of Austria. That's not what we're doing. Now, I want to talk about the consequences of taking this more mundane view of what artificial intelligence is. It's certainly true that artificial intelligence is going to have a serious impact on labor markets and on employment, but perhaps not exactly in the way that you expect. Machines and computers don't actually perform jobs. They automate tasks. Now, except in extreme cases, you don't roll in a robot and show the person to the door and, and kick them to the curb. If your job requires a human touch, such as expressing sympathy or providing companionship, you know, I don't think you really have very much to worry about. Even experts, lawyers and doctors and accountants and all that, spend most of their time doing mundane tasks. These are repetitive tasks, like they review lab test results or the lawyers draft simple contracts. And many of these intellectual and physical tasks require straightforward logic or simple hand-eye coordination of some kind. Uh, and th there are a bunch of new technologies that are poised to automate a lot of these routine tasks. Automation, whether it's driven by artificial intelligence or not, changes the skills that are necessary to perform that work. So what are the jobs of, of the future? These are demonstrations of skill or person-to-person -person interactions. That's the good news. But the bad news is it takes time for these transitions to happen. And there's another dark cloud that uh, relates to advances in artificial intelligence. While it's true that automation actually makes society richer, there are very serious questions about whose pockets are filled by that increased wealth. As economists know, automation is the substitution of capital for labor. The struggle between capital and labor is a losing proposition for workers. What that means is that the benefits of the new automation naturally accrue to those who can invest in the new systems. And the problem that we have is that our economic policies and our regulatory policies have been decoupled from our social goals. We don't have to steal from the rich and give to the poor. What we need to do is to provide the proper incentives for entrepreneurs and businesses to find better ways to benefit a larger swath of society. Our technology and our economy should serve us, not the other way around. Thank you very much.
All right, let me, let me just start with this, and I'll dive straight in. I've got a 10-year-old daughter. What should I be telling her to do as a, in her profession? That's a really good question. Um, I have, this is one upsmanship, I have four daughters. Two of them just got their first jobs. And the peculiar thing about this is that neither of the jobs that they got existed 10 years ago. Right. One of them is a so, does social media promotion for restaurants in San Francisco. And the other one works at a company called Udacity. It's an online education company. Didn't exist 10 years ago. And they're just right out of college, right out of school. You know what they're looking for now uh, at companies like Udacity? They don't expect people to have any experience in what they're doing. Uh, they look for a broad liberal arts education. What you want to do for a 10-year-old is make sure that they learn good critical thinking skills. And then you, we have to stop thinking about education is you go along, you get some general education, then you learn a profession, yep. and you're stuck in that profession for the rest of your life. Yep. We have to begin to think of education as an ongoing process of retraining. These are problems that you are raising. Do policymakers get this? Uh, generally, I think the answer is no. Uh, the only uh, light on the horizon in this, at least in the U.S., is that both major political parties understand now that income inequality and wealth inequality is a real problem. Now, you have to talk about the time frames, though. In the short run, it's just like what happened during the Industrial Revolution. Oh, great, now we have machines that can weave, and, you know, the weavers are all starving, and uh, it's the same thing. It's just a modern version of that, that same process. Uh, the question is, do we want to change the policies uh, to make a more humane path to a, to a better future? Fascinating things. So thank you very much indeed. Thank uh, you so much. Jerry Kaplan, everyone. Thank you.